stare We spoke of was and when Although I wasn't there He said I was his friend Which came as some surprise I spoke into his eyes I thought you died Chapter 17 Oh, Master, grant that I may never seek, Andrew sang, so much to be consoled as to console. He laughed to himself We prepared for the meeting with his childhood parish priest. Sam had assigned him to pick up the donation. He who lacks seniority must appeal to the gods, Sam teased. Andrew caught his reflection in the microwave and remembered the dress code St. Augustine's had instilled and how they carried on at people for good. Brown or black dress shoes, polished. Collared shirt, ironed. No messages, political or indecent, printed on clothing. Men should be clean-shaven or facial hair neatly groomed. His hair was styled. The wire sticking from his face could use a trim, but he would be hidden in front of a computer screen following his meeting. It would not matter. He was fine with the orders, until he no longer had to take them. Then he wondered why he continued. Put in the work and pay the bills was the clear message. It was never fine fulfillment. His shirt was too big. Paying for a tailor felt like overkill. That was something you did for others, not yourself. With some time to kill, Andrew embraced the sunshine of early spring and listened to the water trickling from fountains, the hum of traffic, and the occasional trailing conversation of stay-at-home moms engaged in their own philanthropy. Serenity in the big city. Make me a channel of your peace, he sang again to himself. It was the song of his elementary school graduation. His mother was watching from the crowd. The sea of navy and baby blues distinguished the boys from the girls and started rumors among the parents. A few of these girls had seen too much, and most of the boys, not enough. Whose parents were alcoholics and which ones were divorced? Who cared? These people knew everything about these city blocks and nothing beyond them. Andrew wanted out. He did not fit in. He was bespectacled with large cheekbones, fragile but thick. His mother's instability was one of the topics of conversation, and Andrew wished she had seen nothing and heard even less. After eighth grade graduation, the children were dragged to a diner by moms who split the bill and tipped the waitress a hundred percent because they knew her. Andrew's mother would be taking the next shift and made uncomfortable jokes about missing out on the post-graduation rush. This moment was not about her son. She was incapable of being selfless. Husbands did not join these dinners whether they were in the picture or not. Their time was over, and the check was covered. Games were on. They wanted their kids to run free so they could have a shot with their wives. The single mothers had it worse. They had to be doubly shamed by some loser boyfriend who may or may not show up to the ceremony for a picture. When he arrived at the St. Augustine Rectory, Andrew was greeted by the aging women who had been there since he was in the third grade. They were frozen in time and found security in this nonsense. Soon, Father Lachlan appeared from his secluded office, carrying the same air of self-importance Andrew remembered. Nice to see you, Andrew. This fucking guy. The subtle digs. He would rather him not recognize him at all. Andrew worked in the parish from time to time as a kid and bought into this bullshit rhetoric. Sitting across from him was a man in Farragamo loafers who chose serving people as his calling. He was built for judging others. Somehow, he was able to grift these people while being devoid of all logic, interchanging magic with faith. Hi, Father. 
Andrew stepped into a wood-paneled office that forever stunk of old cash and stale coffee. The priest instantly made his checkbook visible. I take it Samuel is doing well? He is, Andrew answered. He sends his regards. I'm sure he does. His politics follow the money, or else he would be here. I'm of no use to him. When the church is fashionable again, he'll be here. What's your deal? Back with the faith? No. I thought you converted to Judaism. No. That was a joke, Andrew. Fuck off. All you do-gooders, Father Lachlan continued. You never need God. You need room to play the role. Something we have in common. Father Lachlan smirked and scribbled in his checkbook. I don't even know what this does anymore, the priest said. Consider it a tithing, Father. Andrew stuffed the check into his shirt pocket and stood up. His offer for a handshake was not received. The priest sulked, conscious of his own mortality. Upon leaving the rectory, Andrew directed his eyes to the concrete staircase ascending to the entrance of the church. To be understood as to understand. The lyrics rolled off his tongue as he journeyed toward the stained glass doors of the past. His fingers lingered over the holy water stoop in the empty church. He considered praying, but could not bring himself to believe it worked. Now, those Sundays seemed like wasted time. All the sacramental conditioning was a distraction to keep the children well-behaved. He felt betrayed for believing it all beyond the age of reason. He splashed the holy water on his forehead for good measure, made the sign of the cross from muscle memory, and bolted for the doors. Once outside, he lingered on the stairs, catching his breath and reliving his childhood. Every February, the children at St. Augustine stood in line atop a dusting of snow, preparing to march through the church and express their sins to an old man in a box during their first confession. The installation of Catholic guilt began at that moment. It was a lifelong project, with its scaffolding ever-present, working toward an increasingly unreachable ideal. What sins could one have possibly committed at eight years old? In that moment... The children were most afraid of the pedophile whose greatest powers was a booming, cackling voice. It posed a more imminent threat than the fire and brimstone tales used to keep them fearful of straying from the herd. Andrew remembered shaking while kneeling in the confessional, innocent of even understanding the terrible shame adults brought to this box. Their affairs, their lustful desires, and their hatred of their children were expressed to men whose life paths were designed to avoid such problems. Andrew was there to confess he backtalked his mother and disobeyed his teacher. He was sentenced to one Our Father and two Hail Marys. A sheet of ice covered the stairs of the church. Whole extended families crammed through the exits to get to the church hall for refreshments first. In the shuffle, someone's grandmother slipped. Andrew could not remember if he should have caught her. Was he too slow to react? Or would it have been impossible? My brain, she kept screaming. My brain, my brain, at least three times. And then I heard my mother ask, Did you let her fall? I don't remember anything about the rest of the scene, and honestly, I think it was a different time than my first confession. I don't know. It doesn't matter, Charlotte told him. In my memory, it's my grandmother's silhouette, but they all had that perm, Andrew said. I can't remember her face. I should have seen it coming and dove for her. My mother's accusation was enough. I denied it, but it made me question myself. Did I move out of the way, and was I less of a man? I can't pick everyone up to stop them from falling. No one can, Charlotte interrupted. You're carrying too much. 
Andrew stood in the windowsill, looking at the moving city below him. He wanted to hoist himself into the lights and live multiple lives reincarnated among the city's best and brightest. At worst, he would be memorialized by individuals who would recognize him posthumously in the coveted 30 under 30 list. It would be a good marketing tool during Suicide Prevention Month to tug at the heartstrings. They would hand out the awards, give a moving presentation to the man they ignored while he was alive, and leave his mother to pick up the pieces. He saw the old woman's blood in the snow, while he stood in disbelief. Two of his peers' fathers brought her to her feet. His mother shouted at him again, Did you let her fall? He stepped down from the ledge. Charlotte was gone, and he was unsure of the day.
Spoken by 